Okay, to understand the dissolving process, we really have to recall intermolecular attractions. Uh, so being aware of London forces, dipole-dipole and hydrogen bonding between molecules, and also being aware of the ionic attractions between ions. And it's comparing the strength of the attractions between the solute particles and between the solvent particles, and then thinking about how the solute and solvent particles will interact that really determines and explains the solubility of substances. So just to emphasize, <clears throat> here I have a beaker of water and you can see the little V's representing the little bent water molecules. There's going to be hydrogen bonding between those water molecules and when a solute dissolves in this beaker of water, it's going to be because there's an attraction between the water molecules and those solute particles. Because if there wasn't a significant attraction there, then we would find that the water molecules stay hydrogen bonded to each other and the solute particles cluster together and do not dissolve. And so ultimately we're comparing the strength of the attractions between, <clears throat> between particles. When we compare the strength of the attractive forces between the different particles, we'll have a prediction of solubility. So for example, the solute-solute interaction in an ionic compound will be the ionic bonds between the ions of opposite charge. In um, a sample of water as the solvent, it'll be the hydrogen bonds that occur between water molecules. And then when one of these ions and water particles interact, we call those ion-dipole attractions. So ultimately, ionic solutes will dissolve in water if the ion-dipole attraction is significantly strong enough to pull those ions, for water molecules to pull those ions away from the crystal lattice and overcome the strength of the ionic bonds. You've seen from our solubility guidelines <clears throat> that not all ionic compounds are soluble in water. Some have very low solubility. In those cases, these ionic bonds are significantly strong enough that very few ion dipole attractions form. And so the bulk of the ions remain bonded to the other ions in the crystal lattice. Okay, so we'll set up a little T-chart here then to track the different types of solutes and solvents and their relative solubilities. So when you consider an ionic compound, I've just been talking about this one, for example, like NaCl, <clears throat> think of the types of attractions that occur between ions in the ionic compound. Hopefully you're thinking here of ionic bonds. And a polar molecular solvent will have the ability to have London forces, right? Possibly dipole-dipole, or as in the case of water, even the ability to hydrogen bond, which of course water does. So what is that set up in terms of solubility? Well, ionic compounds, for the most part, have good solubility in water. <clears throat> it's true that as you saw in the solubility guidelines, carbonates, phosphates, hydroxides, sulfides, there are some that are not very soluble, although there are a number of exceptions there. But typically ionic compounds are pretty soluble in water. And again, that is due to the ion dipole attractions. So it's important that you learn the terminology so that you're able to describe um, why these substances are soluble. And just to remind yourself, um, these terms have all been discussed in earlier lessons in the unit. And so I'm not spending a huge amount of time redoing these. Um, it would help for you to draw diagrams, for example, a hydrated ion here with water molecules surrounding it with the <clears throat> bent water molecules with the oxygen end of that water molecule that's partially negative attracting this positive ion. Remember the partially positive end are the hydrogen ends of the water molecule. And so we have an ion dipole attraction. So it would be a good idea for you to draw diagrams to accompany these. Okay, um, what other combination could we have? Well, <clears throat> what about a polar molecular solute in a polar molecular solvent? 
So what do we expect here? Well, what types of interactions do polar molecules experience? Well, they've definitely got LDF, right? And their dipole-dipole attractions. Possibly, <clears throat> possibly even hydrogen bonding. Solvents then that are also polar mo molecules will have London forces, dipole-dipole, and even the hydrogen bonding. So we tend to find polar molecules of solutes dissolve well in polar solvents because they're able to interact with each other through those dipole-dipole or even hydrogen bonding interactions. So if molecule, if, if a solute particle over here, let's say I'll draw the par solute particles in green, if the partially positive end of this molecule is attracting the partially negative end of this molecule, so here we have a polar interaction. Now if I were to use, um, let's say, blue circles to represent the solvent particles, because these are also polar molecules, I have the same types of interactions happening. So does that mean that the, the green solute particle that is polar and the blue solute particle that is polar, does that mean that these can interact well? Well, sure they can, through the same dipole-dipole or hydrogen bonding potential that existed between the solute and the solvent particles themselves. <clears throat> And so we see that both ionic compounds and polar molecules or polar molecular solutes dissolve well in polar solvents. What about nonpolar molecules? So if we have nonpolar molecules, so a nonpolar molecular solute, for example, I2, and I guess I didn't give you an example of a polar molecular, so maybe we'll look at um, CH3OH. So that would be one you could practice, right? And our, our typical polar molecular solvent will be water. <clears throat> so if you think of iodine here, singly bonded, two iodine atoms singly bonded, hopefully you're recognizing this as an electronegativity difference of zero, and with only one nonpolar bond in the molecule, it's certainly a nonpolar molecule. How does that substance dissolve in a polar molecular sol solvent like water? So why don't you make a list of the intermolecular forces that the solute experiences? So between adjacent iodine molecules, what types of attractions would exist? So here. Right between water molecules, what type of attractions would it, would exist? You can write that here, and then predict what you think the solubility will be. Will there be a strong interaction between the iodine molecule and the water molecule? There needs to be in order for that solubility to be good. Okay, so hopefully you were thinking LDF forces between iodine particles since they're both nonpolar molecules. London and either dipole-dipole or, in the case of, of water, we have hydrogen bonding, so significantly strong intermolecular attractions here. And now, how will these two interact? Well, very poorly. There'll be no significant interaction between a nonpolar molecule and a polar molecule like water. All they can do is London force attract between them, and that's not going to be enough to overcome the strength of the hydrogen bonding that water molecules experience with each other. Or if it's a different polar molecule not capable of hydrogen bonding, the dipole-dipole force that's between those particles. And so again, the key is that there's no significant attraction between the solute and the solvent that would be strong enough to overcome the attractive forces between the polar solvent particles. Okay, so if we don't have a polar solvent, a polar molecular solvent, then we'll have a nonpolar molecular solvent. Examples here could be um, oils or greases. Um, we're looking at nonpolar molecular compounds that are typically liquids. And so the next three sections of our table all have nonpolar molecular solvents. You'll notice down the middle here. 
So part D looks at ionic solutes in nonpolar molecular solvents. E looks at polar molecular solutes in nonpolar molecular solvents. And F looks at nonpolar solutes in nonpolar molecular solvents. So if you're understanding how we've, I've approached this lesson in the table, then I'm expecting you to be able to predict the solubility for D, E, and F. So again, a quick refresher. Identify the attractive forces that exist between the particles within the solute, here, here, and below. And then what types of particle or strength of attraction exists between the nonpolar molecules in these, this solvent in each case? And then ask yourself, how will the two particles, one from here and one from here, interact? Will that be strong enough to overcome the attractions between the solute particles, between the solvent particles? Like, do we have a strong enough interaction to overcome either here or here? And you can predict your solubility based on that. So give it a shot for D, E, and F, and then check back with the video. Okay, and so hopefully you thought ionic bonds between the ions in the ionic compound. And because the molecules of the solvent are nonpolar, they'll be London forces only. So will ions overcome the ionic attraction between them in, and attract to nonpolar molecules that only have the ability to London force? Definitely not. There is no significant attraction between ions and nonpolar molecules. And so the ionic bonds existing between the ions and the solute being much stronger will hold the ionic compound together and this solute will not dissociate um, and form a solution. Polar molecules have the ability to London force, um, London dispersion force as well as dipole-dipole or possibly hydrogen bond whereas our solvent still has the ability only to London, um, London attract. And so we would expect the solubility between these two particles to be poor. The polar molecules here um, and the nonpolar molecules are only going to experience London forces between them. And so the hydrogen bonding or dipole-dipole forces between the solute particles are much stronger and therefore the solute particle will stay together rather than dissolve. Okay, so try the third case here, the last one, nonpolar molecular solutes and nonpolar molecular solvents. Okay, so if we have nonpolar molecular solute and solvent particles, they're only capable of London forces and with each other and um, within each solute <clears throat> sample and solvent sample. So if all the particles can do is London force and there isn't anything stronger holding the solute or solvent substances together, then yes, these substances will dissolve. And so for our example, we had the iodine solid earlier and some oil or grease, certainly the iodine would dissolve in the oil. Okay, so just to understand per perhaps how equations are written here, a dissociation, uh, refer or that term, <clears throat> if you recall, refers to the ions in a crystal lattice separating and as they are pulled away by water molecules. So if we were to write a dissociation equation for <clears throat> calcium chloride, we would use our cross down method to write the formula of calcium chloride and as a solid, once that is put into water, calcium ions and chloride ions are formed. The calcium ions are surrounded by water molecules through the ion dipole attraction, and so are the chloride particles. Remember to balance the equation, so we'll need two chloride ions, as indicated by the two here. So this is an example of a dissociation equation for an ionic compound. And so we'll be using those when we solve some stoichiometric problems later in this unit. Okay, now what if you have a molecular compound dissolving in water? Well, typically then we would, <clears throat> and I don't think you're really going to be using this this um, uh, this unit, but if you had um, glucose, let's say, dissolving in water, we would just show that those molecules become surrounded by water. There is no breaking up or, or 
dissociating, no covalent bonds are broken. Literally, the water molecules would just attract the polar sugar molecules and form an aqueous solution. Okay, so dissociation specifically refers here to the ionic compounds. Okay, this is just then a, an equation for the dissolving of a molecular solute. Okay, and you can see we go from the solid to a solution of that. Okay, the last concept to cover here is the idea of surfactants. So you may think of um, oil on or grease on a dirty frying pan and wonder how, when you put that in a sink of water, how you're able to clean it. And certainly, if you didn't have the dish soap, you'd be hard-pressed to remove that oil. And so here's where chemists play with the ability of particles to have intermolecular attractions and figure out a way for a detergent molecule to make two seemingly immiscible substances or liquids mix. And so if you have oil on a frying pan, you have a nonpolar substance. <clears throat> well, we need a molecule that's going to be largely nonpolar so that it can interact with the grease. And that's what you have in a soap or surfactant molecule. This section here is a nonpolar hydrocarbon chain. So it's just a whole bunch of carbons singly bonded to each other with hydrogens bonded around. So this is, we use the term, a very hydrophobic area of this molecule. So hydro meaning water, phobic meaning fear or fearing. So this is a water fearing section of the molecule, which means that if you have nonpolar molecules around, for example, oil or grease, that this, this section here will have the ability to London dispersion attract between these nonpolar <clears throat> uh, the nonpolar oil and the hydrophobic or nonpolar end of the detergent molecule. Now at the other end of the molecule here, we have the polar end of the molecule. So this is the polar part of the molecule. This is then the hydrophilic or water loving, oops, water loving section of the detergent molecule. And so this end of the molecule will interact very well with water molecules through either dipole-dipole or even hydrogen bonding. And so essentially, chemists solve the problem of oil and water not mixing by creating a detergent molecule, a surfactant, that will essentially interrupt the attractions of hydrogen bonds that water molecules experience between themselves and other water molecules. If we insert this surfactant, this detergent, into our water, so we make our water soapy, then the polar or hydrophilic end of the surfactant molecule will interact well with the water and break up or disturb the surface tension of the water in such a way that the other end of the detergent molecule will interact with the grease. And in doing so, we can essentially lift the oil off of the pan. And so if I just give you a quick sketch here, the idea is that if you have a dirty a dirty pan here, right, that has the oil in the pan and we have a detergent molecule, the idea is that the detergent molecules will interact with this grease but via their nonpolar end or the hydrophobic end and in doing so water molecules that are out here right water molecules that are in the the water are going to interact with the polar part of this detergent molecule and don't forget that there are other water molecules also right and so these still experience hydrogen bonding between each other and so Gradually, the water molecules and the strength of these attractions here 
will essentially pull on these surfactant molecules and it will allow, it'll create some lifting here for other detergent molecules to start to work their way under this grease. And gradually the grease lifts and we end up with soapy water that has particles of oil or grease. So let's quickly redraw this. That have, you know, imagine that this that this oil has started to lift because it has been surrounded by these detergent particles. Right? And so the oil is coming off the pan as we have water molecules busy interacting with the polar parts or hydrophilic ends of the surfactant. And so we finish up with a clean pan, right? And we'll have our grease pocket here that is surrounded, or pile of grease that is surrounded by the surfactant molecules. Certainly you wouldn't want to wash your face with the dirty dishwasher or d dirty dishwater after cleaning a greasy pan. And that's because within that water is now these piles of grease or oil that are surrounded by the soap molecules. Of course, not to forget about the water particles that are also interacting, right, with the polar ends of these surfactants. So an application of these polar and nonpolar uh, molecules and their solubility. You might check out lava lamps, have a look at a picture of a lava lamp online and see if you can figure out how they make a lava lamp. Think about solubility.